Good evening. If you will, get your Bibles out and go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We will begin our study there in just a moment. In Acts chapter 4. I want you to know that it is a privilege to be with you this evening. There are so many of you that I know and have known for many, many, many years. And uh, it's uh, really not like I'm visiting anywhere because I know so many of you. It uh, is just a pleasure to be here. I have so much, so much respect for, for Brother Wes. He and, and my family have been friends for as long as I can remember. He was very close with my grandfather and, uh, and uh, spoke at his funeral and just have the utmost respect for him, not only as, as a friend, but as a, a preacher of God's word. He is so knowledgeable and preaches the truth, and you are blessed to have him with you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, of course, it has been announced, I'm Landon Manning. I uh, uh, preach on Sunday mornings at the Pleasant Grove Congregation. been doing that for about six years now. Um, we have a a thing worked out to where brother uh, brother Philip Owens, of course, is there. Uh, I preach on Sunday mornings, and he teaches Bible class, and then he preaches on Sunday evenings and does Bible class on Wednesday evenings. But with uh, with me preaching, that allows him to do some extra work out in the community, and he holds a couple of classes each uh, each week, and then he also uh, goes to uh, goes to the prison with brother brother Cooper and, and several others. Uh, so we've been doing that for about six years now, and it. Uh, it's just a joy to be with, with those people there. And I know many of you have, have ties and know, know people there as well. Um, also want to, uh, before we get into our study, uh, many of you know my, my cousin Larson Plyler. Um, and many of you have probably heard what is going on with him. He has a brain tumor. Um, he's 34, has four children. Um, he preaches at the Quinn Congregation up in Russell. And uh, he is to travel uh, tomorrow uh, up to Memphis to Le Bonner Hospital uh, where they'll begin some tests early uh, Tuesday morning, kind of some brain mapping to figure out where speech and uh, other, other things that, that go on uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his brain are. And then he will have about a 12-hour surgery on Wednesday. Uh, and then they'll get a 24-hour path report and then a final path report in about two, uh, about two weeks. But please keep him in your prayers. It's very serious. The tumor's about the size of an egg. Um, but it hasn't slowed him down. I got to spend Thursday part of the day with him. But he actually preached this morning at Quinn. Um, and uh, almost an eerie uh, title, but he preached on uh, the to live is Christ and to die is gain, uh, which is, uh, is almost humbling knowing the situation that he is in. I want us to, in our study this evening, to reflect upon ourselves. I want us to look into the mirror and examine ourselves as we go through the study this evening. It's a study of, of self-examination. As, as, as Shrek would say, I want us to peel back the layers of the onion and to examine ourselves for who we truly are. I want us to be honest about that. You see, there, there, there's two ways that people often look at themselves. Oftentimes, they're their own worst critic. And sometimes, they're so blind that they don't see what's going on in their lives. I want us to look at ourselves this evening and examine ourselves according to God's word so that we can be the best child of God that we can possibly be. I want us to start out this evening by asking you a few questions just to get us to thinking about our study. What are you known for? What are you known for? Are you known for being helpful? Maybe kind or loving? Maybe funny? Maybe an optimist or a pessimist? Are you known for being truthful? What about maybe being short-fused or angry? Or maybe lazy? Or maybe a gossiper? Are you known for having a strong faith? 
Are you known for having a weak faith? Are you known as a Christian? The list could go on and on, but I, I want you to think about how you are known. I want us to think about what does our family say about us? Are we a good husband? Are we a good wife? Are we an obedient child? Are we a good representative of what a Christian should be? What do your friends say about you? Do they say, oh, he's, he's faithful, he's a Christian? Or do they say, oh, no, they're, they're, they're two-faced? They act one way with a certain group of friends, a certain group of people. They act another way with another group. And we probably all know people like that. What do your fellow Christians say about you? I know of some so-called Christians who will drink, speak profanities, dress immodestly when they're with friends, and then try to portray to be the best Christian around those of the faith. And you may be able to think of some people that are that way as well. If your family, friends, or fellow Christians were to give you a name for what you were known for, what would it be? I know of a man they call Turbo because he's so fast. I know of a, another guy they call Cheeseburger. I'm not even sure what his real name is because all he eats is cheeseburgers. I know another guy that they call Pork Chop because he eats a lot. I know another guy, his nickname is Fat. You can only guess why, because he's fat. And I can say that because I resemble that remark. I know another guy named Foot because he wears a size 22 shoe. I know another guy named Butter because his skin is so soft and smooth like butter. But that's what these people are, are known for. But this evening, we're going to look at Barnabas. How are you known? In Acts chapter 4, if you turn there, you look at verse 36. It says, thus... Joseph, some of your versions may say Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus. We see here what Barnabas was called. And he was called by what he was known, the encouragement that he gave. And we'll look more at that here as we go through our study. If you think about the society in which we live, we live in a society that is self-centered, that is all about me. But as we will go through our study, we'll see that Barnabas was not that way. We're going to take a look at Barnabas this evening and why he was called the son of encouragement. And we're going to take some of those things and make some application to our lives. I love to read different translations of the Bible. It gives us oftentimes a clearer understanding of God's word and what is meant. Looking at that passage there, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, the old American Standard Version says in Joseph, who is the apostle, was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted son of exhortation. The old King James Version calls him son of consolation. The New American Standard renders it son of encouragement. And then the Young's Literal Translation interprets it son of of comfort. 
Are you those things? Are you an encourager? Are you a comforter? Are you an exhorter? Are you a consoler? If not, why not? Could these things be said about you? Let's look a little bit deeper at the word that is used here. The word encouragement is paraclesis. Strong's G3874. It is used in the Bible 29 times in 28 different verses. Consolation, exhortation, comfort, entreaty. It's a calling near or a summons, especially for help. It's an imploration, a supplication, an entreaty, an exhortation, an admonishment, encouragement, consolation, comfort, solace, that which affords reverence of comfort and refreshment. It's a persuasive discourse, a stirring address. And if you just simply type in Google and say, define encouragement, this is what you get here. The action of giving someone support, confidence, or hope. Is it evident to why we need to be an encourager? Oftentimes to give people support, to give people hope. Let's look a little bit more detailed at the text in which we're talking about. In Acts chapter 4, let's begin in verse 32 and read through verse 37. This is such a rich text, and we could not talk about so much other than just Barnabas here. But beginning in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. There's so much going on here, not with just Barnabas, but with the group of Christians that are there. It shows how tight-knit that they are and how they cared for one another. There was help given anywhere that it was needed. No one was in need. The unity that we see here. Do we see this kind of unity today? I don't know that we do. Imagine what's going on here, how close that they are. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to sell something of great value and give it to those saints who were needy? We see that Barnabas did. He sold something of high value and he gave it to the apostles to be distributed to the needy saints. I also want us to Realize here, who gave Barnabas this name? The apostles gave Barnabas his name, son of encouragement. These are the same apostles that were chosen by Jesus Christ. They would not have taken this lightly. He was given this name by the apostles. And I think that that's very important for us to realize in our study, because it shows how he was known and what he was known for. They would not have given him this name if there would have been any question about his character, 
about his actions, or about who he was. Barnabas was committed to the cause of Christ. He was not controlled by worldly things. We see in Hebrew, or in, excuse me, in Matthew's chapter six, in verse twenty-one: "For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." We know that people of the world get caught up in worldly things all the time. We see it each and every day. But oftentimes I'm afraid that Christians get caught up in worldly things as well. You see, where your treasure is, there is your heart. How much time do we spend studying God's word? How much time do we spend studying God's word outside of Sunday mornings and, and Sunday evenings and Wednesday nights? Do we spend more time watching television or on social media or just wasting time when we could be studying God's Word? You've probably heard of the 100-hour rule. 100-hour rule is that if you for 18 minutes a day for a full year practice something, whether it's playing an instrument, uh, putting golf, whatever the case may be. If you do that for 18 minutes a day, that's 100 hours in a year. And you will be better than 95% of the world's population at that craft if you participate in that in 18 minutes a day. Do we study God's word 18 minutes a day? That's kind of a humbling thought, isn't it? We call ourselves Christians. We're committed to the cause of Christ. But yet our actions show that maybe our treasure is really somewhere else. As I said at the beginning, examine yourself as we go through this study. Look in the mirror. Give an honest reflection of what you've seen. And if you don't like what you see, fix it. Change it. <clears throat> he did not love in word only. He showed it. We see that there in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. It says here, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. How many people do you know that are all talk and no action? How many of them are that way that are Christians? Are you one of those? We hear a lot of times people, people talk when they're in the church building and when they're in worship services, but when they walk outside on these four walls, that's all it is is talk. The action is not there. But we see with Barnabas, the action was there. He sold a field, took that money to the apostles to take care of the needy. <clears throat> Barnabas was committed to the cause of Christ. He would not be a man who would rob God. In Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, it says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. 
we can probably all quote James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. I think sometimes we forget that. That really all the things that we have are not ours. We've been blessed with those by God. And if we see someone in need, especially those of the household of faith, we need to take care of them. It's our duty. We need to remember where everything we have comes from. We see here in Acts chapter 4 that it just wasn't Barnabas that was focused on this, but it was everybody. So important. But we also see that Barnabas lived just as he was called by the apostles. He stood up for Saul, Paul, when everyone else was scared of him. We see that in Acts chapter 9, beginning here in verse 26. It says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road that he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. We know the story here of, of, of the conversion of, of Saul, Paul. We know that, that he persecuted Christians, drug them out of their homes, but in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, Jesus even tells him, you were persecuting me. You were persecuting me. But what, what does he do? He sees the error of his ways. He changes. But because of his reputation, what he was known for, they were afraid of him. But what did Barnabas do? Barnabas knew him. And he stood up for him. Do you stand up for other Christians when they're right? When they're being persecuted? When the situation calls for it? I have seen times where a Christian is standing up for what is right and they are standing up by themselves. They don't have the support of their local congregation or fellow Christians. But what did Barnabas do? He stood up. He encouraged. He exhorted the church at Antioch. In Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19 and reading through verse 26, it's a little bit lengthy reading, but I think it's very important for us. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus and took Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Have we thought about that, that, that Barnabas was, was part of that, responsible for that exhortation of those in Antioch where they were first called Christians? Have we thought about that? He had a hand in it. I ask you this evening, 
What do you do for the church? What do you do for the church here at North Bend? What do you do individually? I will tell you collectively that this congregation has an extremely fine reputation. Known for being good students of the Bible. For standing up for the truth. For knowing God's word. But what do you do for it? Do you help? Or do you hurt what this congregation is known for? How are you known outside these four walls? Do they say, oh, he's a, he's, he's a member at North Bib. There's some fine people there. They're strong in God's word. They're great Christians. Or do they say, well, he goes to North Bib. He is a hypocrite. He goes to church and then he's out drinking and partying and running up and down the road using foul language. What are you known for? We see what Barnabas was known for, but what are you known for? Like Aaron and her, Barnabas gave similar encouragement. In Exodus chapter 17, we probably all remember the story here, in Exodus chapter 17, Beginning in verse 10, it says, So Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands on one, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Do we stand by other Christians and hold them up when they are weak? Do we lift them up when they need it the most? Maybe when they're sick. When they've lost loved ones. What about when they're spiritually sick? Do we encourage them? Do we stand beside them? Do we lift them up? Oftentimes I've seen people who are in sin, living in sin, that those of the faith turn their back on them. I don't want to be around them. But sometimes all they need is a little bit of encouragement. Somebody to stand there with them, to lead them back, to hold them up. We see what Barnabas did for Paul. He wasn't well known, was he? But he stood up for him. He encouraged him. We see what Aaron and her did for Moses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. I ask you, are you doing that? Are you building up one another? So many Christians tear each other down many times to make themselves look good. They just put others down. You know, the thing about encouragement is it's so easy. Sometimes if someone's sick, send them a card, phone call, text. It really literally doesn't cost much, does it? But how good does it make them feel? But you see, encouragement and helping others is a two-way street. Because it helps you as well. You feel like you've accomplished something. You've done something good. In this day and time, so many people are takers and not givers. We need to encourage one another. We need to give encouragement to each other. 
We need to stand up for each other, especially when we need it the most. But do we do that? You see this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, just as you are doing. Are you doing it? Are you encouraging one another? Are you building up one another? If you're not, you need to start. I will tell you this. If you do that, this congregation will grow. It will grow closer together. It will grow tightly together. And it will grow in spirit and truth. We must encourage one another. We must build up one another. We all see that, also see that Barnabas was forgiving. We know the story of John Mark. When he left Paul and the others, we know that there in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 13 and in verse 13. It says, Now Paul and his companions set sail for Pamphus and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. We know that when John Mark left here, that, that, that it created some doubt. It created some ill feelings. There was some disagreement going on here. But what did Barnabas do? Barnabas showed that he was willing to forgive and put the past behind him. We see that in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 36. It says, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought, thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark, took him with him to, and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been, <clears throat> having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. You see, Barnabas stood up for John Mark. Enough that he took him with him to spread God's word. He knew what he was worth. Do we stand up for our brethren? Do we know their worth? But more so, are we willing to forgive one another? heard a story of another gospel preacher. He was in a gospel meeting. And there was a congregation about this size. And he noticed that there were two brothers in the congregation that if one was on one side, the other was on the other side. And they would completely avoid each other. You see, there had arose a conflict between the two of them. And they just refused to forgive each other. On Friday night of the meeting, both of those brothers led a prayer. The gospel preacher that was in the meeting there, he said, I'm not so sure if those prayers made it out of the top of the building. You see, they weren't willing to forgive one another. They were brothers in Christ but couldn't get along. We've got to be willing to put our differences aside and focus on God's word. Why? Because we're to forgive one another. Because we're forgiven. Now I'm not saying cutting anything short of God's word. Nothing less, nothing more but God's word. But when there are differences that really don't matter, especially spiritually, Put them aside because we all have the goal of heaven and we've got to help each other get there. And if we can't get along with one another in a worship service, in a congregation, wow, that says a lot, doesn't it? We need to be forgiving 
just as Barnabas was forgiven. But later on, because of Barnabas' example, Paul began to trust John Mark. We see in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, Luke alone is with me. What does Paul say? Get Mark and bring him with you. For he is very useful to me in this ministry. You see, because Barnabas stood up by his brother, he stood up for what is right, Paul began to trust again and realized his value. What if Barnabas had not stood up for John Mark in Acts chapter 15? What would have happened? Would he have remained faithful? We don't know. Would some of those that he helped, even Paul, his usefulness in the ministry, what would have happened without him? We don't know. But what we do know is because Barnabas stood up for him and knew his value, Paul began to trust him and saw his value as well. We need to stand up for our brethren. And I don't think we do a good job of that sometimes. We have to do that by knowing each other, by being around each other other than just a few hours a week that you're here. You see, the Lord's design of the church is so wonderful. We can help each other. We can lean on each other. We can encourage each other. We can build up each other. And we can hold each other up when we need it. But do we take advantage of it and do we do it? Take a look in the mirror. How are you doing? I want to leave you with three thoughts this evening. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was certainly the right name for him. Why? Because that's what he was known for. He lived it. If you were to be giving a name based on how you live, what would it be? Would it be faithful? Would it be a Christian? Would it be an encourager, strong in the truth? And I ask you, would it be a name you would be proud of? Would it be a name worthy of being called? If not, change your perception that people have. Be a Barnabas. Be a Barnabas. The study is yours this evening. I want to encourage you to be the Christian that you ought to be. To be the congregation that you ought to be. To help each other get to heaven. If you're not the Christian that you ought to be, fix it, change it. Hopefully you were looking in that mirror this evening and seeing how can you be the Christian you ought to be? How can you be better? If you're not a Christian, why not? It is the greatest choice you will ever make in your life. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You are not promised tomorrow. Do it now. If we can help you in any way this evening, please come as we stand and as we sing.